thank you thank you very much thank you andrew thank you all all of you for having me um this talk is about two warring tribes in data science and statistics the bayesians and the frequentists who here is familiar with these two views on how you should analyze data all right and who is belongs to one of these tribes who is a bayesian okay who's a frequentist Wow. <laughs> All right. So I'm here to tell you it doesn't have to be like this. These are, these are families of techniques that have mathematical validity, both of them. They don't have to be warring tribes. You don't have to belong to one or the other. And that's sort of the message of this talk. So I'm going to talk about how the Bayesians and Frequentists shall lie down together. So let, let's talk about what everyone agrees on, whether you're a Bayesian or a Frequentist. Everyone should agree on, on sort of the math. You know, when we talk about the probability of something, uh, who here is familiar with these axioms of probability? When we talk about probability, you know, there's, there's some uh, stuff that can happen, and then there's some subset of that, which is a particular event. So the stuff that can happen is somebody's going to be elected president, and the subset is, you know, it's going to be Hillary Clinton, it's going to be Donald Trump, it's going to be Gary Johnson. <laughs> um, so given that you have these events, the subsets, and the sample space, we can define a probability of some particular thing happening. And this probability, it's a function of the subset, and it obeys some common sense rules. You know, it's got to be a real number between 0 and 1. Uh, the probability of everything is 1. You know, someone's going to be president. And, you know, if, if the subsets are disjoint, uh, you know, if they can't both happen, then the probability of the union of them happening is just the probability of the sum of them happening. So the probability that Hillary or Trump becomes president is just the same thing as the probability of Hillary plus the probability of Trump. They're not both going to be president. So these are, you know, these are the axioms of probability. These were first written down in 1933 by Kolmogorov. Everyone agrees on this. The Bayesians, the Frequentists, everyone's agree. This is like the, you know, the, the part of the Bible we all agree on. Um, <laughs> there's some theorems. You know, you can prove things. This is math, so it's like you can make some theorems. So you know, the probability of not Hillary equals one minus the probability of Hillary. The probability of nothing is zero, etc. Some nice theorems. Still not controversial. It's math, and we can have some definitions like math. We can say, you know, for any two subsets A and B, any two events, the probability of A and B, we'll call this the joint probability. It's the probability that A and B both happen. And we can, that's the joint probability. We can also define the conditional probability. If we know that B happens, then what's the probability that A will happen? What's the probability of A given B? So we write it like this, the probability of A given B. You know, the probability that if Hillary is elected, then something else will happen. And that's just defined to be the probability of A and B divided by the probability of B. We divide by the thing that we know happened. We know B happened, so therefore we're interested in the probability that they both happen, given the probability that, that B happened. And we say that two events are independent if the uh, joint probability is the same as just multiplying the two separate probabilities. So telling you about one doesn't tell you any information about the other. Um, and if they're independent, then the probability of A given B, well, it's just the same as the probability of A. The fact that I told you that B happened, Hillary, you know, the, the probability that, uh, you know, the lottery will be 13 tomorrow, given that Hillary is elected, that's just the same as the probability that the lottery will be 13 tomorrow. It doesn't depend on the event. All right, still fine. Now let's talk about a nice theorem. This is the theorem uh, by a religious person. It was a reverend, Bayes, in England, and he died, and then in his writings they discovered this beautiful theorem. Uh, now, we've, this is the definition of conditional probability. The probability of A given B is this A and B divided by B. We can flip the symbols around, get the same thing. We can manipulate this, the, uh, the symbols a little bit. We get the probability of P and B. You know, we just multiply both sides by PB equals probability of A given B, PB, which is also probability of P given A, PA. You can flip around a little bit, and you get this nice thing here, that the probability of A given B in terms of the probability of B given A. That's very interesting. So if we wanted to know the probability, you know, given that Hillary is elected, that the country explodes, we can express it in terms of the reverse conditional probability, the probability that uh, Hillary will be elected given that the country explodes. All right, so let's talk about why this is interesting. Uh, I'm a big sailor. I, it wasn't mentioned in my biography, but I love to sail. Uh, and I was in the Caribbean recently, and there's an archipelago there. It's a, it's a country with two islands. There's saint fricantiste it used to be a French colony, and just next to it is Ile Bézienne. It's the same country, but two islands. I was down there, this is me, uh, and I, I visited the, 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 the local authorities, and it was actually a tragic time for them, because they told me that their king had been poisoned, the king of both islands had been poisoned. So that's, that's, a, that's a problem down there, they don't like the poisonings. So a letter went out from the central government to the governor of each island, frequentist and Bayesian islands, letter went out, and it said, Dear Governor, 
attaches a blood test for proximity to the poison. It has a 0% rate of false negative and a 1% rate of false positive. Jail the responsible parties. But remember the nationwide law. You must be 95% certain to send a citizen to jail. You gotta be 95% certain. They, they believe in civil rights down there in the <laughs> French Caribbean. So this letter went out. I happened to be on saint fricantiste when they got the letter. And the question is, how do you interpret this in the language of probability? You know, they get this letter, it's in French, but they got to turn it into uh, mathematics. So how do we do it? Okay, so it's pretty easy. Uh, what is the, the conditional probability of a negative result given that someone's guilty? Zero. Uh, that's what it means to have a 0% rate of false negative. Does that make sense? So if someone's guilty, if the test said negative, that would be a false negative. Now that's a 0% chance. Okay, so the probability of a positive test, given that you're guilty, is 1. That's good. And now, what's the probability? We have a 1% rate of false positive. So that means, given that the person is innocent, the probability of a positive result, a false positive, is 1%. And the probability of a negative result is 99%. So there's a 1% rate of false positive. So that's just how we translate these statements uh, into math. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, how about the second sentence? You must be 95% certain to send a citizen to jail. How do we translate that into math? Well, it's obvious. We just say the probability that we send someone to jail, given that they're actually innocent, has got to be less than 5%. We have to be 95% certain of their guilt to send them to jail. That's the obvious translation. So can, can you just take everyone with a positive result and send them to jail? Why no? Why no? Because there might be a large number of innocent people who got false positives. Um, well, what's the pro so we know that the probability of jail given innocence got to be less than 5%. And so what if we just jail everyone that has a positive result? Then the probability of positive less than innocent is what matters. And what is the probability of positive given innocent? 1%. Yeah, the probability of positive given innocent is 1%. And that's less than 5%. So yeah, you can jail everyone with a positive result. Great. So then I traveled to Ile Bézien. It's very, very simple sailboat. Uh, and they have the same problem there. They got to interpret this letter in French, turn it into math. So the first sentence, they interpret the exact same way as their people on uh, their friends in, in the Frequent Island do. Same way, 0%, 100%, 99%, 1%. And they got to interpret this, we must be 95% certain. Now, how do they turn that into math? Well, it's obvious. Um, the probability that a person is innocent, given that you're sending them to jail, has got to be less than 5%. That's the obvious interpretation, right? If we're going to be sending someone to jail, there has to be less than a 5% chance that they're actually innocent. It's obvious, right? Who thinks it's obvious? Okay, well, on the last slide, we had this one. G given that someone's innocent, the probability that we're mistakenly sending them to jail, that has to be less than 5%. Who thinks that one is obvious? More people. So you're, you're, you're the frequentists. You didn't think it, but you're the frequentists. Yeah. So it's not so clear how to interpret this. So on the Bayesian island, they say, OK, well, it's obvious. Given that someone's going to jail, the probability that they're actually innocent has got to be less than 5%. That's our interpretation. OK, so the same question. Can you take everyone with a positive test and send them to jail? Well, here it's, it's harder to answer the question, because we can substitute jail for positive here. But then we got to figure out, what is the probability of innocent given positive? We don't have that information. We have the probability of positive given innocent. But what we're trying to find is the probability of innocent given positive. We don't have that. How do we flip it around? Bayes yeah, Bayes' theorem, exactly. And that's a theorem. Everyone agrees with that theorem. OK, so let's do the math. Great. So here's the thing that we know, the probability of positive given innocent. Here's the thing that we want to find out, the probability of innocent given positive. Right? OK, so can you just Take get on the positive to jail. Okay, so we're going to take this positive and we're going to turn it into jail. Great. Now we're going to take this one and we're going to turn it into what? What's the probability of a positive result if you're innocent? 0.01. Great, 0.01. Okay, now we're going to take this one, we're going to expand it, and then we're going to take this and we're going to expand that, you know, no problem. And now we're going to take this one and we're going to turn it into what? Whoa, whoa, whoa. The probability that a given, <laughs> this is the probability that a given islander is innocent. We have How many people are in the population? Yeah. Well, a million. One over one million. Know, well, oh, this could be a conspiracy. We don't know how many people are involved. What's the probability that a we, What's the probability that a given person is innocent? How big do we think the conspiracy? Well, we don't know. I don't know. 
Do you, do you really need that information? So. You do. So that's strange. How come the frequentists didn't need this? <laughs> well, to, 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 to calculate this, we actually need information that's not given. We need to make a further assumption. Uh, the question is, what is the probability, knowing nothing more about someone, you haven't tested them at all, before you test people, prior to any tests, what's the probability that someone's innocent? We need some sort of assumption. It has to come from somewhere external to this problem. So that's, that's something different about this Bayesian islands. They have to make these assumptions about the prior probability before they do any tests that someone's innocent. So let's say they make an assumption. Let's say they make a very aggressive assumption because it's a real law and order island down there. Uh, so you know, we, we don't know it. Let's make a very aggressive assumption. The probability that someone's innocent is only 90%. The assumption is that 10% of their people are guilty of this conspiracy. That king was not a well-liked figure. Um, <laughs> So, so, so if they make this very aggressive assumption, can they jail all the people with a positive test? They're really making a very aggressive assumption that 10% of their people are guilty. I'm sorry, does it any of it matter at all? Well, we, uh, to calculate the probability of innocent given that you're going to jail, right, but you need to fill a in a value here. Sorry, what was that? They, they cancel out? Uh, unless it's why, zero. Why they bottom? don't because the, on the bottom, the oh, only I'm sorry, the one line here. Yeah, oh, I see, I see, I see, yeah. the brackets, right. All right, so it turns out even if you make this very aggressive assumption like an evil dictator, you still can't do it. If you plug and chug, the probability of innocent given jail is still greater than 5%. So you actually have to make an even more evil assumption than this to be able to send anybody to jail. So on the Bayesian island, nobody goes to jail. On, on, on St. Frequentiste, 1% of the population at least goes to jail because that's the false positive rate. So their whole population, 1% at least goes to jail. Those are just among the innocent people. On Il Bézien, we assume that 10% of the people are guilty. That's a crazy aggressive assumption. And still nobody goes to jail. So they end up, despite this evil assumption, they end up being actually much more like protective of the innocent people. But the disagreement here, what is it about? Is it about philosophy? Like, what is the meaning of probability? No, no. And is it about the theorems or the, the math? No, what's the disagreement? The facts. Well, uh, What's a, I don't think they disagree on the facts. You know, they have the same false positive rate and the same false negative rate. And I'm, I mean, they agree on all these facts. Is that the definition of certainty? Yeah, it's how do you interpret this? We must be 95% certain. On the Bayesian island, they interpret it to mean the probability, given that you were sending you to jail, the probability that you're innocent has to be less than 5%. On the frequentist island, they interpret it to mean, given that you're innocent, the probability that we mistakenly send you to jail has got to be less than 5%. That's the disagreement between these two islands, is how they translate this French phrase into math. It's not, it's not, about, uh, you know, it's not about philosophy or the meaning of probability or how, interpretations or any of that stuff. It's about what do we mean by certainty. So, and, and they care about different things. On the frequentist island, again, they're caring about the overall rate of false positives, the rate of jailings among innocent people. If you're sitting in your house and you know you're innocent, you're going to have a 1% chance of going to jail by mistake. That's what they care about on the frequentist island. In the Bayesian, they care about, you know, within their jail population, what percent of the inmates are actually innocent? So it's a different question. One, one side, you're looking at the whole population. What percent of these people are we going to mistakenly send to jail? In the Bayesian island, among the jail inmates, what percentage of those people are actually innocent? So they're caring about different things. And only the Bayesian had to make this assumption about sort of the overall rate of innocence. That was a, a, a difference. So in general, it's this notion of certainty and what do we mean by certainty that delineates the difference between the two sort of schools of thought about data analysis, data science. In general, there's this sort of paradigm where there's some underlying truth. You know, there's some fact. You're innocent or you're guilty or, you know, Oreos cause cancer or they don't cause cancer or what's the data science problem maybe your customers have? You know, this advertisement converts more readily than some other advertisement. You have some hypothesis um, and that's the truth. Uh, and you're never going to be able to exactly know the truth, but you can perform some experiment to probe the truth. And the output of the experiment is some observation, you know, some reading. You know, it's like the number of people that clicked on this ad versus the number of people that clicked on this ad. Uh, we put that into some sort of inference procedure, and the output of that is some expression of our uncertain knowledge, like an interval on the parameters. You know, the efficacy of this ad is between 4% and 9% of people are going to buy the product if they see that ad. That's like a, an expression of uncertainty. You, you ever calculate something like that? You know, some sort of confidence interval or... Yeah, so that, this is the general paradigm. So I'm going to tell you about something that happened to me as a kid, and then I'm going to give you some case studies that happened to me when I was a newspaper reporter. And all sort of in this general paradigm. I grew up in Chicago, actually, with Andy. You remember Jewel, the supermarket? 
Yeah, so they used to have, uh, we were not that wealthy. We didn't used to get like the name brand Oreo cookies. We just got like the president's choice, the store brand cookies. <laughs> and my, my mom would do the grocery shopping for the family. And they used to have four different assortments of these generic chocolate chip cookies. And each assortment would have 100 cookies in it. But the distribution of chocolate chips per cookie would vary. You would never know if you were getting the A type, the B type, the C type, or the D type cookie jar. Each cookie jar had 100 cookies in it. But there's different numbers of chips on the cookie. So given that you had an A-type jar, for example, if you reach in at random and pull out one cookie uniformly at random, you know, there's a 70% probability that your cookie's going to have two chips on it. And there's a 1% probability your cookie's going to have no chips on it. Whereas if you had the D-type jar, there's a 70% probability your cookie's going to only have one chip on it. So the way these cookie jars worked, Every column here represents a probability distribution of 100 cookies. And so each column adds up to 100%. So uh, I used to do this experiment where I would try to identify you know, which cookie jar did my mom bring home. So the experiment looked like this. The underlying parameters was the, the name of the cookie jar, A, B, C, or D. And I wouldn't know that, but there, that would be some fact. What kind of cookie jar is it? And the experiment was to sample one cookie. And the, uh, the, the observation was to count the number of chips that I got on that cookie, you know, 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4. And then I would express some sort of uncertainty interval, like which jars could it be? Like, oh, it could be a B or a C jar. That was my, my game when I was a kid. It was broad lawns and narrow minds is what Hemingway said about our hometown. So this is how we entertained ourselves. So I, I grew up actually, uh, you know, in the 80s. So it was really all about this frequentist methodology. Uh, so we had this notion of the way we express our certainty is with something called a confidence interval. Uh, who's heard that phrase, a confidence interval? Yeah, so this is the definition. A 70% confidence interval procedure includes the correct jar with at least 70% probability in the worst case, no matter what. Now, no matter which jar it is, the worst case, it will have a 70% chance of including the correct jar. So I'm going to take you through what I mean by that. So again, every column here is a probability distribution. And now we're going to generate a confidence interval procedure that works in the scenario where we pick a cookie at random. So what that means is that for each type of jar separately, we have to make sure that the resulting cookie uh, ends up producing an interval that includes the right jar. All right? So, the, the, um, so let's say we're in the A-type jar, for example. What do we have to make sure? Well, it's very common that I'm going to get the cookie with two chips. So we have to make sure that we include that in the interval. So what this means is that if I pull a cookie with two chips, the resulting interval has to include an A-type jar. Because the interval procedure is a mapping from the number of chips, that's the observation, to an interval on the underlying parameter, A, B, C, or D. But we have to make sure that within every column, uh, the jars included in the interval sum to 70%. Is that clear? You're nodding. OK. So we have to make sure that for an A-type jar, for example, so this is actually enough. This is enough to guarantee that this is a valid conference interval for A-type jars. Because if I reach in and I see two chips, I say, OK, the resulting interval has to include A. And that's going to work 70% of the time. Because 70% of the time I'm going to reach in, it's going to have two chips. I'll say it's an A, and I'll be right. So I'll be right at least 70% of the time. So let's move on to the next column. I'm just going to highlight the biggest number. And then we don't quite have 70% yet, so I'm going to highlight the second biggest number. And then still not, so let's do the third biggest number. And still not quite, so I'll do the fourth biggest number. OK, we got it. So this meets the criterion for a B-type jar. Remember, we have to do this worst case, every possible column. So in this one, uh, if it is a B-type jar that my mom brings home, um, I'm going to reach in. And if I got one chip, two chips, three chips, or four chips, the resulting interval is going to include B. So therefore, at least 70% of the time, in this case, I'll be correct. Does that make sense? So if I pull out two chips, for example, I'm going to say, oh, it's A or B. All right, so let's do it for this C. I'm going to highlight the biggest one and the second biggest one. Great, I'm done with C. And we'll do D. I just have to get that 70. Great. So this is a valid 70% confidence interval for the cookie jar scenario. No matter what I pick out, let's say if it's two, two chips, I'm going to say, oh, it's A or B. If it's three chips, I'm going to say it's definitely B. If it's one chip, I'm going to say it's B, C, or D. That's the confidence interval procedure. And this meets the criterion. In the worst case for any type of jar, I will be correct at least 70% of the time. Great. So this is how I learned it. Now, my sister came along like eight years later. Did you ever meet my sister? Yeah, she was, she was younger. I mean, she was in you know, grade school when we were in high school. She was raised in the new ways. She learned the Bayesian way. So that's different. 
So the Bayesians don't use these confidence intervals. They use something called a credible interval. The definition is different, just like on those islands. A 70% credible interval has at least 70% conditional probability of including the correct jar, given the observation and given those prior assumptions. That's so about after we do the experiment, we say, what is the probability that it was this jar, given my observation? And we want to make sure to include at least 70% of that probability mass. All right, so let's construct those. So we got to make that prior assumption. So let, let's make one that, you know, the jars are equally probable. You know, you go in and jewel, it's just random, whether they have the A's, the B's, the C's, or the D's in stock. So I don't know if that's true. Um, when I was a kid, the danger of going to the grocery store is your teacher might be there, so I was always too shy to do that. So I don't know the procedure for selecting these cookie jars, but maybe it's uniformly random. We have to make that assumption if we're going to do Bayesian. So we'll make that assumption. So now we're going to calculate that. So remember, we're starting out with this probability, given that we know the jar, A, B, C, or D, the probability of the number of chips we're going to get. And that's not what we need. We want the opposite. We want to know, given that I got a certain number of chips, like three chips, what is the probability that it was a particular jar? That's what we're really interested in. So we have to flip this around. So we're going to do this by applying Bayes' rule. Here's how we're going to do it. First, we're going to take these columns, and we're going to multiply everything by one quarter. Remember, that was the uniform probability. So we're going to see the probability, the joint probability, that it's a certain jar, and we get a certain number of chips. And all I did was multiply all these numbers by one quarter. So now instead of each column being a probability distribution, the whole table is a probability distribution, and the sum of the whole table is 100%. So this is the joint probability distribution. So we could say the probability of this event, my mom brings home a D-type jar, and it, I pull out a cookie and it has three chips on it, this event has probability one over four. And in total, they add to 100%. All right, so that's applying that prior. So now we're going to go through every row, uh, and we're going to say, okay, what if I actually, now I've done the experiment, I've reached in and I get zero chips. What is that? Uh, so, yeah, zero, zero chips on the cookie. What does that tell me? That tells me which row I'm in. I'm not in this row. 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 I've got to be in that top row. So yes, I only had 13% of being in that row prior to, to looking at the number of chips. But now that I've looked at the number of chips, I know I'm in that row. So it shouldn't say 13% anymore. What should it say? 100%, exactly. So I'm just going to inflate these numbers until it adds up to 100%. I'm just going to keep multiplying them until it gets to 100%. So now this row is a probability distribution. We started out with the columns, then we had the whole thing, now we have the row. And I'm going to do that on every row. Boom, 100. Boom, 100. Boom, 100. Boom, 100. All right? So now what we have is the probability, given that I know how many chips I had, the probability of which jar it is. And now every row is a probability distribution, and every row adds it to 100%. So we just applied Bayes' theorem. OK, so now we just got to make the intervals. So this is how my sister was taught to do it. We're going to take these conditional probabilities, which are also known as posterior probabilities. This is after we've done the experiment. This is our probability, given that it was this number of chips. After we saw the number of chips, the probability that it was a particular jar. And we're just going to circle at least 70% of the probability mass in each row. So in the first one, we'll do the biggest number, and then the next biggest number. Great, we're done with that one. And then the biggest number, and the next biggest, great, biggest, oh, that's good enough. Uh, next one, there we go, and next one, great, we're done. So remember, earlier we were caring about those column sums being up at least 70%. Now we're caring about these row sums being at least 70%. So this is, these are my sister's credible intervals. And what this means is if you get, for example, two cookies, you say, you know what? With 74% confidence or credibility, uh, it's got to be type A. So one time, one day, my sister and I compared notes. And these at the top are my intervals, the confidence intervals. And these at the bottom are her intervals, the credible intervals. And uh, I looked at her intervals. And I, you know, I was my younger sister. And I said, what are you doing? This is crazy. What happens if our parents bring home a type B jar? You are going to be correct only 20% of the time. You're going to be wrong. 80% of the time, because they bring home a type B jar, the only time the resulting interval is going to include B is if it's uh, got, you, you happen to pull out a cookie with three chips. That only happens 20% of the time. The rest of the time, you're going to be wrong. You are wrong 80% of the time. How can you say you're wrong 80% of the time, but you're claiming to have 70% confidence? That's insane. You, 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 it doesn't make sense. And she says, well, what does she say? Right. Yeah, she says, that's OK, because I've made the assumption that type B jars only happen 25% of the time. So the fact that I'm wrong 
there, it averages out because I'm right so often on the other types of jars. So it all averages out. Yes, every time they bring home a type B jar, I'm going to be wrong 80% of the time and still have 70% confidence, which seems perverse. But it's OK because I'm assuming that those will only happen 25% of the time. I'm like, well, I, I mean, that's, you're staking a lot on that assumption. But she says, well, wait a minute, Dito. She calls me Dito. She says, wait a minute. Look at your intervals. Your intervals are even more insane. This is crazy. Like, what happens if you reach in and you pull out a cookie? It doesn't have any chips on it. What do you say? And I say, oh, I say it came from a hippopotamus. <laughs> it came from the empty set. Because uh, I just don't have a Mac in there. I say, with 70% confidence, it came from a hippopotamus. And she says, that's insane, because you know it didn't come from a hippopotamus. I mean, it had to come from some jar. How can you claim with 70% confidence that it came from no jar at all? And I say, well, it's OK. Why do I say it's OK? Because that's going to happen so rarely, because you know I make up for it with my uh, good coverage on the one, and the two, the three, the four chip cookies. So it's OK because I say it's OK because other outcomes will happen often enough that it's fine. And she says it's OK because other jars, she's assuming, will happen often enough that it's fine. So who's right here? Wh which set of intervals makes more sense? OK, everyone at the beginning said they were evasion. Is anyone flirting with frequentism? was, but I'm flipping back now. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Uh, my intuition tells me that if the Bayesian's correct about the, uh, um, about the prior assumption, then the Bayesian's more, then the Bayesian's more correct. Mm -hmm. However, I don't think I can say anything stronger than that. Yeah, now let me tell you one, one more problem with the Bayesian assumption. Now, number one, they had to make that assumption, which is, you know, that they were staking a lot on that. But number two, I, I, let's say I get, I get a jar, and I reach in, and it's got zero chips. I, I give some ridiculous answer. So what if I just repeat the experiment? I reach in, I get a different cookie, uh, and I, you know, just do the same thing again, just to give a different interval. I, I can keep sampling the same jar, and I'm going to be correct 70% of the time. Uh, my sister can't say the same thing, because my sister's errors are correlated with the identity of the jar. If it's a type B jar, she can keep sampling it as many times as she wants. She's still going to be wrong 80% of the time. If she has 100 robots each go to her jar and sample one cookie and look at it and, and, and come up with a belief state, 80% of those robots are going to be wrong, and they're all going to have 70% confidence. Uh, whereas I can have 100 robots go in, and yeah, some of them are going to be crazy, but the majority will be, at least be correct. So uh, the Bayesian's errors are actually correlated with the truth. If the truth takes on an inconvenient value, the Bayesians, all the Bayesians, or at least the vast majority of the Bayesians, can be wrong, and wrong with high confidence. Whereas the frequentist errors are only correlated with the observation. So the frequentists can repeat the experiment. Yeah, they're going to be wrong, but they can repeat the experiment and fix it. Whereas the Bayesian, repeating the experiment doesn't help. The error is actually correlated with inconvenient values of the truth. They're really, the Bayesians really have this notion of an inconvenient truth, whereas the frequentists, they can have an inconvenient <laughs> observation, but it, yes? If, if I'm a Bayesian and I repeat the experiment, though, um, don't, don't you sort of like not include the prior with every iteration of the experiment? Well, it depends. If you can bring all the information to one place, like a dictator, and the dictator makes the inference, then yes. So let me show you. So th these critiques, it's not like I invented these critiques. These critiques of the frequentist and Bayesian schools of thought have a long history in the literature. So here's a famous critique of the Bayesian school of thought. Excuse me, a famous critique of the frequentist school of thought. This is a famous paper by my colleague, uh, why most published research findings are false. <laughs> so the argument here is very simple. It says, to get a paper published in the biomedical literature, you have to have, by the frequentist standards, uh, less than a 5%, you know, 95% certainty, just like on that island. Uh, you need to have 95% certainty. And the problem with this is, let's say, again, you know, 1% of the hypotheses that you investigate are actually true, but you have a 5% rate of falsely finding these hypotheses to be true. That means among the things you publish, you know, of all the experiments you do, 6% of them are going to be publishable, and of those, 5 are going to be wrong and 1 is going to be right. So you end up with 5 sixths of the published literature is actually the false positives. So that's the argument. It's just like on that island. You end up sending 1% of the people to jail, even if, you know, all those people might be innocent. So that's the critique of the frequentist way. But here's the corresponding critique of the Bayesian way. Uh, this is in a fancy named journal, so you know it's true. The impossibility of Bayesian group decision making with separate aggregation of beliefs. 
this is just what we were talking about with a robot problem. If, the, if, if every robot wants to come to its own conclusion based on its observation, you can have 80% of them come to the wrong conclusion and yet have 70% confidence in their wrong conclusion. The only way to make consistent decisions is for them all to agree to pool their information with one guy, and that person does the inference and just informs everybody else what the truth is. You need sort of a dictator. Uh, but you can't, you can't separately aggregate the beliefs and, and come up with a sane solution. So, you know, if Mongo to be incorporated gets all the world's data and, you know, comes to all the conclusions, maybe this can work. But if you want to, there's no way to do it in a decentralized way. That's sort of an uncomfortable result, too. Data analysis is hard, you know? Yes? Wait, if they all share um, both prior and posterior, can't they kind of divide out the evidence that each one saw? And then... I know. I think you need the observation. You need, like, the specific... Like, you need to know how many... Uh, I think so. Well, the, I'm sure you can share a ratio of something, but I, I think your belief state is not enough. So yeah, so this this is hard. So um, that that's sort of the theoretical dispute in my view. The difference between the Bayesian and frequentist schools of thought, I think, is explained in those sort of cookie jar examples, and there's sort of no free lunch. Uh, so now I'm going to shift gears to the second half of the talk and ask, do these Bayesian versus frequentist issues actually account for statistical disagreements that we see in the real world? I think it's often you read an article in the New York Times or something, and there's some study that seems improbable. Like there's one about ESP a few years ago, where a researcher found that you can you know, manipulate things with your mind. And the critique in the New York Times was, oh, well, that's frequentist reasoning. But if we do it the Bayesian way, we wouldn't have this problem. Have you ever, anyone ever read anyone say like this? Like, oh, we just need to have a more enlightened approach? Anyone ever seen that? Yeah. So I think my view is that this is actually very, very rare. Although this is a real, real problem, uh, it's not a real problem. It's, it's a real issue of disagreement, this Bayesian versus frequentist. Uh, as far as I can tell, the times when it causes a real dispute in the real world are very rare. So I'm going to take you through some cases where it might have been the case, and we'll look at whether it really is a Bayesian versus frequentist issue or something else. So I'll give you two case studies. These are real world case studies. Uh, they both happened when I was a, a newspaper reporter. So uh, you know, diabetes is one of the major uh, diseases in the world. It's dramatically increasing here in the developed world. Something like a third of the U.S. population has diabetes or pre-diabetes. It's just crazy. And the number one drug for diabetes was this drug, Avandia, rosy glutazone. It was approved in 1999. It's sold by a major drug company. There was $3 billion of sales of this pill in 2006. Um, and there's been increasing pressure on the pharmaceutical industry to release everything they know about these drugs. They used to just release sort of the studies that they wanted you to know about. Uh, and you can see why there's problems with that. So there's been a lot of pressure on them to just release everything they know. And GSK, to their credit, tried to do the right thing. In 2004, they said, OK, fine. If you want all these like tiny little lame studies we've been doing, you can have them. So they, they published them. And this is what the results look like. They say, in this internal study, we gave a Vandia to 391 people, and two of them got heart attacks. And we gave a control group to 271 people, 207 people, and one got a heart attack. Or in this study, 110 and 5 and 114, 561 and 0, 276 and 2. This is what the raw data look like. And it's pretty messy because you know the control group, for example, sometimes is no drug at all, or sometimes it's metformin, which is a different diabetes drug. And the durations of these studies are different, and the definition of a heart attack is different. So it's pretty messy, but they published, you know, 42 of these small studies. I don't think they thought anything would come of it because, you know, their data scientists had concluded, well, we didn't call them that then, their biostatisticians had concluded that, you know, there was nothing more to be inferred from these, these data. But uh, in 2007, a cardiologist at the Cleveland Clinic, a prominent cardiologist, uh, Stephen Nissen, uh, published a paper uh, where they agglomerated all the studies together. They did something called a meta-analysis, where they tried to sort of average them all together. And they found bad news, so effects of Avandia on the risk of heart attack and death from cardiovascular causes. And they found we conducted searches in the published literature. Um, you know, they found 42 trials. And they said in the Avandia group compared to the control group, uh, the odds ratio for heart attack was 1.43. So basically a 43% increase in heart attacks. 95% confidence interval was between 1.03 and 1.98. So what, what would it what would it 1.0 mean? No effect. Yeah. So the, the lower end of their confidence interval is 1.03. So they're very flirting with uh, flirting with no effect here. But they were they able to exclude the possibility of no effect with this 95% confidence. So but it seems pretty close, you know. So what do you think would be the reaction to this, you know, from the real world? <laughs> 
That is true. Well, let me, sh let me show you what the data look like. So this is the actual data. Um, they took each study individually, and they came up with a confidence interval on uh, we're looking at the relative risk. So this is really just, if it's one, that means no difference. If it's below one, that means Avandia reduces heart attacks. And if it's above one, that means Avandia increases heart attacks. And what they found, so in each study, there's a little tick mark, which is sort of the best guess, the point estimate, and then there's this uh, confidence interval. And you can see they're all over the place, but the meta confidence interval at the bottom here just barely excludes um, no effect. It's pretty wide, but it does exclude no effect. So these were the actual results. And the result was dramatic. So this is the front page of the Wall Street Journal, above the fold, very top, May 22, 2007, by my colleague Anna Wild Matthews, medical detective. Sequel. So this guy had already brought down a different blockbuster drug. Sequel for Vioxx Critic. Attack on diabetes pill. Glaxo shares plunge as Dr. Nissen sees wrist to heart from Avandia. And he gets his picture and uh -huh. um, the coveted picture. I never got a picture when I was working at the Wall Street Journal, but my friends just got me one for my birthday. It was a treasured <laughs> present. But it takes like five hours to make one of these pictures. Okay. Um, and you can see the sales going up and up and up. So guess what happened to Avandia after this study? It was almost no effect. It was 1.03 was the lower end of the confidence interval. Front page of the Wall Street Journal, guess what happened to this $3 billion a year drug? These are the sales. Oh. And the FDA has now strongly restricted Avandia. Yes? Is it fair to say, though, that if we're guessing the most likely effect that that's somewhere around a 50% increased rate of heart attack? Well, I don't know about most likely, but the center of this confidence interval is a 43% increase. So if I were to guess one number to actually make a choice on, that would be what I would do. Yeah. Well, well, I don't know. What if I told you it was a 43% increase is our best guess, but it really could be anywhere between a 90% decrease and a 44% increase. Then what would you do? But some of those probabilities are more likely actual. Well, the frequentist method doesn't let us talk about the probability of the heart attack risk given the observation. That's that flip that you want to do. But we don't have that. Right. We just have the interval. How do you know anything if you don't know the absolute risk of the heart attack? Well, it, it, it varies based on the population. It varied among those different studies. So there were healthy people, not healthy people. So they, they modeled, this is a very good question, they modeled a multiplicative effect. So, I mean, if I were a doctor deciding whether to prescribe or a patient deciding whether to take, I'd want to know my absolute risk of the heart attack, given that I already had diabetes, I assume. Yeah, well, this is a good question. Um, you know, there's a few answers. I, you could imagine that doctors might say, you know what, Avandia's benefits are so good that what we're going to do is we're not going to give this to people with a high pre-existing risk of heart attack, but we'll keep giving it to people with a low pre-existing risk of heart attack. They might do that. And this is the kind of conversation that the regulators uh, and, you know, the medical professions have to have. Uh, it's hard to know, though. I mean, what is your risk of a heart attack in the next five years? Do you know? Well, I, could, you know I could find out for, for a woman like me, you know, with various factors, I could find yeah. the number. Yeah, so this is, what, this is the kind of conversation that they, that they have. And, and they decide, is there some population where it's maybe safe to keep giving them Avandia, or can we not say that? And it also depends on what other drugs are available that might not have this increased risk but have comparable benefits. But that's the kind of conversation they have. But they, do, they, they um, model this multiplicative risk. You know, if you go into the study with a 1% chance of heart attack, this will make it 1 times N. And then in a different study, if you go in with a 5% risk, it'll be 5 times N. That's what it means, odds ratio or relative risk. So I, I, you know, I said, well, this study's pretty close to the line. I wonder if I get the same result with a Bayesian method. So I tried that uh, with my colleague, Josh Mandel. We looked at what would happen if you did a Bayesian estimate. Now, this is the flip that, that you want to do. What is the actual probability, in this case, a probability density function, the probability of Avandia's relative risk, this multiplicative effect, given the observation? So now, because it's Bayesian, we actually can look at those probabilities. And this is what we get. This is, this is what we get. So what does this mean for Vandia? Yeah, it lowers. I mean, the bulk of the probability mass is actually below 1. So there's the frequentist one says, uh, here's the frequentist one, says above 1. And the Bayesian one says below 1. So did everyone get it wrong? We should all be taking a Vandia? So we also looked at one other thing. We said, what if we assume it's not a multiplicative risk? Um, what if it's an additive or subtractive risk? Because, you know, it doesn't always make sense to say multiple. Like, let's say there's a pill that had a tiny bomb in it that just exploded. <laughs> you wouldn't say, like, oh, what is the risk 
multiplier that this pill caused. You know, I went in with a 0.1% chance of exploding, but after taking the pill, it multiplied my risk by 43% extra. But if you go into the whole skills. Yes. Right. So it, it, it's not clear the multiplicative risk really makes sense. Maybe it just adds to your risk, you know? So if you do the Bayesian analysis that way, um, you get this. So now uh, the higher is worse because it's a higher risk. And it does look, it's pretty close, but it does look like to the extent it has an added risk, it, it does add and not subtract from your risk. So this is with an additive subtractive model. This is with a multiply divide model. Yes? By the way, what is the difference in the math that you would do by switching the model? From well, um, very little. I mean, you, you know, you, we do this with a Monte Carlo. So we say, let's say someone goes into the study with this risk. We have some prior distribution on the risk of heart attacks. Uh, and if it's multiplicative, we say, okay, so they come in with this risk drawn from a random distribution. And then we apply, you know, the drug's effect. So we, you know, the drug could be add or subtract. That's one kind of model. Or it could be multiply or divide. And we see where they end up. And then we find the outcome that's most consistent with uh, the observation. That's, you know, it's called rejection sampling. Or, you know, this is Bayesian inference. So it's really just about how you do that Monte Carlo. Do you add or subtract? Or do you multiply or divide? Yes? Can we spend another minute on the previous leadership? This one? Yeah. Oh, sure. Um, does this taking other risk factors into account? I don't understand what you're saying. They just said it's coming up with different conditions. Well, um, you know, this this is the raw data. Right. So if we look at the top one, for example, it looks like you are a tiny bit more likely to have a heart attack with a band gun. Well, I don't. I don't think so. This is one per two hundred seven, and if you just multiply it by by oh, two, oh, you get right. two per so four fourteen. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, I'm assuming in order to get the treatment this outcome, that overall the ratios on the left come out to a higher risk than the ratios on the right. Well, I I I, I I'm not sure okay. to be honest. Uh, this, this, the point is there's a, there's a deep subtlety here in, in how you model the effect of these things. And you know the difference between multiplicative and additive makes a difference. It's not necessarily about Bayesian versus frequentist. All of our assumptions go into the data analysis. There's many ways to sort of modify the conclusion. Or if they did the frequentist with the additive. Yeah, I tried that too. Uh, it's confusing. Um, the, the, <laughs> I, I, you, can, you can sort of keep twiddling the data and get it to come out many different ways. Yes? So speaking of assumptions, what's the prior assumption that uh, you made in order to do the big Uniform. Analysis. Uniform over some range. All right, so that's one case study. Uh, let's look at a different case study that I experienced uh, pretty directly as a reporter. I used to write about cardiology, and there's a company in Boston, Boston Scientific, a major medical device company, and they were at the time the leading maker of coronary stents. So these are, uh, you know, if, you, if your uh, uh, arteries that feed blood to the heart muscle get clogged up with these plaques, you, you start to feel chest pain when you're climbing the stairs. And so they can go in through your wrist or through your uh, uh, groin, and they can thread all the way up your vasculature inside the artery itself, and they can inflate a balloon to sort of prop the artery open again and get blood flowing, and then they can leave a little wire mesh behind, a scaffold to hold the artery open. It's pretty amazing. Um, and so we, as a country, we spend something like $20 billion a year on this procedure and these devices. Um, and Boston Scientific was at the time the leading maker of these, uh, they're called stents, coronary stents. Um, and they were trying to get a new stent on the market. They had the market leader, and they're trying to get a newer one. And the government required them to show, with 95% confidence, that it met certain statistical conditions. Namely, uh, that it, it, it's what, what they call non-inferior to the old stent. So they had to demonstrate with 95% confidence that the rate of a certain bad thing was not increased by more than three percentage points. So what we're talking about is the risk after you have this procedure that it somehow doesn't, doesn't stick and you have to go back to the hospital within nine months. It's called target vessel you know, revascularization. So we're trying to make sure that that isn't bad. So they had to show it was within three percentage points of the old stent. So if we knew the old stent was 7% uh, people having to go back to the hospital, then if the new stent is 10.5%, that's bad. Uh, but if the new stent's 9.5%, that's okay, and they can put it on the market. Uh, you know, the company thinks, of course, that they're exactly the same, but there's no way to show statistically that they're exactly the same. They just say, with 95% confidence, it's no worse than three percentage points worse than the old thing. Does that make sense? That's called non-inferiority. And, uh, of course, we don't know the rate in the old group, and, you know, we don't know the rate in the, old, the new group either, so they're both sort of uncertain estimates. 
So uh, instead of cookie jars, uh, the truth is the difference in the rate of this target vessel revascularization within nine months. And uh, the study takes, you know, about 1,000 patients in each group with a new stent and the old stent. The old stent was called Express. The new is called Liberté. These are multi-billion dollar devices. And they decide if the person has, you know, that event or not. And then they run this uh, confidence interval. And then they decide if the confidence interval, you know, the 95% confidence interval excludes the possibility of being three percentage points worse or more. Does that make sense? Okay. So they put out a press release in 2006 uh, from the company, Natick, May 16th, Natick, Massachusetts, and Paris from two locations. Now, if I, I would put Paris first. I don't know if you've ever been to Natick, Massachusetts, but I would have put Paris first, but it's not their choice. Uh, Boston Scientific Corporation today announced nine-month data from the trial. The trial met its primary endpoint. So that means that they, they won. The conference interval, the 95% conference interval, excluded the possibility of inferiority. And that, you know, the stock goes up, everything's happy. Because uh, that's the condition the government had required them to show. Uh, so I later, a year later, they actually published the paper, the scientific paper, in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology. And here's what they wrote. They said the primary endpoint was met with the one-sided 95% confidence bound. Uh, it was at most 2.98 percentage points worse than the old stent. And that's less than the pre-specified margin of three percentage points worse. So they had to make sure it was under three, and they got it, because they got 2.98 success. This is how the American healthcare system works. Um, and they have a p-value of 0.0487. So this is kind of like the inverse of the confidence interval. If you have 95% confidence, that means you have p less than 5%. And they had p of 0.049% less. Uh, and they talked about their statistical methods. They said, uh, you know, chi-square or Fisher exact test was used to compare proportions. They had everything there. So. I saw a debate about which stent was best when I was in, in Chicago for their, the big cardiology conference. I said, well, that's very interesting. I wonder if I can replicate this with a Bayesian analysis. You know, well, let's see what will happen. I used to be, a, you know, I'm sort of a recovering Bayesian. Okay. Um, so I, I tried to do the analysis. Here's the problem. This is the actual results from the study. You know, they had in the control group this many people, and 67 had the bad thing happen. In the treatment group, they had fewer people, and one more person had the bad thing happen. So these are the results. And so let's say you just take a uniform prior on the rate of this event. Could be 0%, could be 100% in the control group, same thing on the treatment group, and you just plug it into Bayes' theorem and you say, what is the probability now of inferiority? And if you do that, you get 5.1%. So with the Bayesian method, there is a slightly greater than 5% you know, conditional probability that the thing you know, is bad. Uh, so I was like, huh. Or does that mean that there's a disagreement between the frequentist and the Bayesian approach? You know, I'm always on the hunt for these disagreements. Well, no, it doesn't mean that. Because how did they calculate this p less than 0.05, this 95% confidence interval? So they said that they use this Fisher exact test in the paper. But it turns out the way these papers are written is like Dr. Turco actually, I've met Dr. Turco. He did not have anything to do with writing the paper. Uh, these medical studies, they find a famous cardiologist kind of all at the end I mean, the company writes the paper. The company has a lot of expert writers and st statisticians. They have 40 biostatisticians. They, they designed the study. They ran the study. They wrote the paper. They did the analysis. And then Dr. Turco kind of comes in at the end, um, or at least his name does. Uh, but I met him. He's a nice guy. Um, so it turns out they did not use Fisher exact test. They, they made a mistake. Uh, they actually used a different method, a much criticized method, called a walled interval, which is not an exact method. It's one of these approximate methods. Because you know, throughout the 20th century, we didn't have computers that could do millions of computations. So we used these approximations. So this is sort of how statistics grew up. So they approximate these distributions, you know, the chance of a patient having a certain event, with these Gaussian distributions. And they actually do a pretty lousy Gaussian approximation. This walled interval is much criticized in the sort of statistical theory literature. It had not yet reached the biostatistics practitioners. So what they do is this integral of this normal distribution, and in fact, they get this 0.0487. So I, I was eventually able to replicate the exact number that they had. Uh, but it turns out, so here's actually the result of the trial. So you can see every possible result that could have happened. Uh, in the control group, they could have had 65, 66, 67, 68 bad events. And in the treatment group, they could have had 66, 67, 68. All the black outcomes are ones where they would have failed the trial by their own method. Um, and the event the outcome they actually got was this one right here, uh, p-value of you know 4.9%. So if they had had one more event in the new stent, definitely flunked. If they had one fewer event in the control group, definitely flunked. And if they had one more event in both groups, they would have flunked. But they somehow were right on the line here. So. <laughs> 
I don't have any evidence that they cheated, but these are the results. Yes. The, when the FDA sets the three percent goal, I would say the company proposes the three percent goal, and okay. the FDA approves or doesn't approve it. Okay. At the beginning, before the trial is run, and they have to commit. Do to they that. attach a methodology to the three percent when they make that proposal? Yeah, they are supposed to send the FDA their complete source code. The FDA okay. is very rigorous about this. They're supposed to include their complete source code at the time. Uh, and I was not able to get that, and the company wouldn't share it with me. But they promised me that the method they did was exactly what they had committed to. But they were not able to prove that. They weren't willing to prove that to me, but they said that. So it was very close to the line. Um, and so, uh, you know, we can look at this coverage here. We can also look at the false positive rate, which is just sort of one minus the coverage. Uh, and so it turns out if you look at this, uh, you know, what is a valid 70% confidence interval? It's one where the false positive rate is always less than or equal to 30%. Does that make sense? So the coverage has got to be greater than 70. That means the false positive has got to be less than 30%. So for a 95% uh, co confidence interval, the coverage has got to be greater than 95%, which means the false positive rate has to be less than 5%. Okay? So here is the actual false positive rate of the walled interval in, in their regime. So here's 5%. Here are all the possible outcomes of the trial. And it's supposed this line is supposed to be below 5%. Uh, this is just, just the same as looking at this line here, the, the false positive rate. Instead, the line is always above 5%. So this means that their test is actually too easy. It's not a 95% confidence interval. It's more like a 94.8% confidence interval. So they set a test for themselves that was too easy, and then they passed it. Uh, and so if you look, um, so, so I called the journal, the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, and I said, I think there may be a problem with this study. You know, I'm a reporter. And they said, we'll have our statistician try and replicate the result. And because the study, but they said, we're having trouble because they say they use Fisher exact tests, but that doesn't seem to work uh, because they didn't. So we'll try some other test that's the most sensible one. And this is the one that the journal statistician tried. Uh, this is also an approximate method. So you can see it's not always below this line, but it's much closer. This is a more common method. But with this method, they, they fail. So the journal said, oh, uh, we, we had to call the company and find out what method they actually used. So it turns out um, with the walled interval, which was the one the company used, they passed. With the one that the journal assumed that they used, they failed. And actually, with every other method you could conceivably imagine that has ever been in the literature, uh, they failed. These are all the different methods for this particular scenario. So th there's many, you know, statistics, there's many different ways to do things. But with all of them except one, they fail, except the one that they did use, I was able to demonstrate is just, it doesn't work because that line is always above 5%. So I, I um, told the company about this and uh, you know I wrote them up a little report in LaTeX, which Andy, you taught me how to use LaTeX and I, now I use those powers for, for evil. Um, I wrote the LaTeX to the company and they were very polite. They invited me out. I had a whole conversation. They said, you know, we think the problem is, um, you know, we initially replicated your results uh, in SAS, but then we hired an outside expert to try and uh, confirm, and the outside expert didn't confirm, and we think the difference is, you know, you were using, we, we the outside expert used double precision floating point, and internally we were only using single precision floating point, so we think the problem is your floating point. And I said, well, this is the only time in my whole career as a reporter did we discuss the precision of floating point, <laughs> only that time. Uh, but I said, you know, I don't think that's the issue because you guys are doing a Monte Carlo. I did the actual calculation, so I think maybe you just didn't run the Monte Carlo long enough. They said, well, why don't you do I think we think it's the floating point. So I went back to my office, and I got Mathematica, and I did the calculation with exact rational numbers, like no floating point at all, like the rational numbers. And these are numbers, these, we're talking about numbers like, you know, 1,000 choose 600. So this is a very big number. Um, and all the digits, like I filled up the swap space, but I was able to get it. And it turns out double precision floating point was good to about 11 decimal places. It's a very good floating point. Uh, that was not the problem. So I emailed them back my Mathematica notebook, and then they asked if they could appeal my decision to the editors. Normally, the Wall Street Journal would not agree to do because they, they would only hear appeals if it's if the allegations the reporter took a bribe or was somehow partial, they would do an appeal. But if it's just a disagreement on judgment, they don't like to do it. But we thought it would be prudent. So they came into our office and they brought the chief medical officer and the chief biostatistician and the PR person who had been the chief PR person for Ted Kennedy. So he was experienced dealing with various various issues. Um, and they, you know, they made their case and they said, you know, there's a anyway. We printed the article. And, uh, this this figure actually appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the actual newspaper. They printed. Mietinin and Nermanin score test. I was very proud that this incredibly obscure stuff was actually printed in the Wall Street Journal. 
uh, source WSJ research. So this is probably the nerdiest article I was able to write while I was there. Uh, here's the actual study on the front page of the business section. Boston Scientific Stent Study Flawed. A heart stent manufactured by Boston Scientific Corp and expecting approval is backed by flawed research. So I was proud of this study. And the result is the study that stent was approved um, by the government, but the competitors to Boston Scientific all used my article in their literature. Um, and now people don't use the Wald interval anymore. So, <laughs> you know, you don't, you don't always have the influence you expect, but this is the influence I had. But again, this is not a case of Bayesian versus frequentist. But this is how statistics sort of is in the real world, in my experience. Um, I'm going to skip this. There's a sort of a technical section here, which I'll skip. Uh, but the, the point is, the, the, the Bayesian and frequentist schools, like, they have much in common. Like, the difference was this question between the islands that we talked about, or between the cookie jars. There's a lot that unites them, and they have this sort of one difference in method about whether you make an assumption or not, and you know which kind of probability do you care about? Is it the chips given the jar or the jar given the chips? That to me is the central issue. This battle has been going on a long time, and most of the time you see a statistical disagreement. It's not about Bayesian versus frequentist. It's about something else. And like the amount of bullshit statistics there is is like it's never about Bayesian versus frequentist in the real world. As much a fan as I am is of this issue. This happens all the time. Here's the New York Times in 2008, uh, front page. Aches, a sneeze, a Google search. Data on web may warn of outbreaks of flu. There is a new common symptom of the flu. In addition to the usual aches, coughs, and sore throats, it's everyone searching for flu symptoms in Google. So Google had announced, and they had a story in Nature, a, a scientific study in Nature, the journal, says they can predict the flu based on searches. And they had uh, training data. They had 90% median correlation. And then they had a held out verification set where they said 97% median correlation in the held out testing set. Now, who has better in the testing set than they had in the training set? That's amazing. Um, and then they launched it in 2008, and they immediately, in real life, had 29% median correlation. Um, and they said, well, that was the swine flu. It was very unusual. They fixed it. It worked until then it broke again. And then it broke again. And now they've given up on it. Um, so this was like, it didn't work. That, to me, is very interesting. And why did we think it would work? This is not about Bayesian versus frequentist, but it is about the fragility of statistics. Here's another study. This was in 2014 in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. This is a serious study. Um, and to explain why this study is statistically BS is, is quite difficult. It's very subtle. Um, I mean, if you look at the data, it, it really depends how you look on it. It's just kind of a sort of risk difference, risk ratio issue. It's, it's not easy to explain. And these things are all around us. Here's one that was just published in 2016. Microsoft finds cancer clues in search queries. Microsoft scientists have demonstrated by analyzing large samples of search engine queries, they can identify internet users who are suffering from pancreatic cancer. I, I, I am pretty You're sure this is not, time. what was that? You're picking up the time. The New York, well, I showed the Wall Street no, no, Journal. It's, it's not the New York Times' fault. Um, I, I have dug deep into the study. I've corresponded with the authors. And it, 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 these claims are, are greatly exaggerated. Um, you know, these companies are under a lot of pressure to show exciting results. Google Flu Trends, Microsoft, they're both under pressure to show exciting results. And this causes us to get a lot of results in the literature that are just greatly exaggerated, uh, including this one. Uh, and these are even companies for which they don't live or die based on the statistics. You know, no one at Microsoft is going to get fired based on whether they can or can't predict pancreatic cancer. But at the drug companies, the company really does live or die based on whether they have less than 0.05. So it's hard to imagine the things that they, they won't be willing to do in that sphere. It's, it's uh, sensitive. Um, these problems of statistics and of probability have been with us, and they always involve the most important problems that we have sort of as, a, as, as humanity. And now it's about drugs and pancreatic cancer. Those are important subjects. But 100 years ago, or 300 years ago, it wasn't about drugs. It was about God. Those are the important subjects that learned people talk about all the time. So this is the dissertation of John Maynard Keynes, the famous economist. But this was his doctoral dissertation published in 1921. And he's talking about the ancient problems of probability and religion. He says, one of the most ancient problems of probability is concerned with the gradual decrease in the probability of a past event as the length of the tradition increases by which it's established. Perhaps the most famous solution of that is propounded by Craig in his Theologia Christiani Principia Mathematica. So this is like the Christian principles of mathematics, published in 1699. So Craig concluded that faith in the gospel, so far as it depended on oral tradition, expired about the year 880. So what are they talking about here? They're saying, if, if I tell you about the Gospels, and you tell someone about the Gospels, and you tell someone about the Gospels, even if you have 99.9% .9 credibility that what the person told you is true, it's still a geometric series, and it's going to go to zero. Uh, so that, you know, the theologians were very concerned about this, and this is what Reverend Bayes probably thought about uh, when he came up with Bayes' theorem. Um, 
Uh, so far as the gospel depended on written tradition, it would expire in the year 3150. Some other guy, by adopting a different law of decrease, concluded that faith would expire in 1789. That's a pretty good guess. You know, that was the French Revolution. That was the American Constitution. That's not a bad, that was the, you know, late enlightenment. That's not a bad guess. But why is this so important? The, 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 the logic of probability uh, and, and posterior probability, why is it important? Well, if we look at the footnote, here's why. In the Budget of Paradoxes, De Morgan, this is a famous British mathematician, quotes the Cambridge Orientalist to the effect that Muslim writers, in reply to the argument that the Quran has not the evidence derived from Christian miracles, contend that as evidence of Christian miracles is daily weaker, 0 0.99 times 0 0.99 times 0 0.99, a time must at last arrive when it will fail of affording assurance there were miracles at all, whence the necessity of another prophet and other miracles. <laughs> so the probability is to believe, you know, eventually Jesus is going to be 0 0.99'd out and the Muslims are going to win. That was the concern of the, you know, the 17th century theologians. Now it's about pancreatic cancer. But we still have this issue where probability is essential to the questions most most important to us, sort of as a species. We have these Bayesians and frequent schools of thought. They're not tribes you have to belong to. And I think that just sort of clouds our thinking about the nece necessary ambiguity of data. Reasoning under uncertainty means compromise, and there's no free lunch. Thank you. Thank you. You can bring this up with your rabbi if you want. Yes. <laughs> the uh, confidence intervals we talked about. So you yes. Call those different methods, or I guess best for statistical significance. Yo, yes. So, I, first of all, I wasn't really clear on whether or not there was a standard with regard to like the government's expectations on the kinds of tests that are valid for um, meeting its requirements. And if we are aware as a community that certain methods are not terribly reliable or whatever the case may be, why don't we have a, a kind of subset of tests? Like, in what cases would you, for instance, consider Gart and Nam score over the Wilson score? <laughs> like, what are the different modes of, or different cases in which you choose one over the other? Yeah. Sorry, well, can you just repeat the question so everyone can... Oh, sure. The, the question is, you know, shouldn't there be, if there's so many tests, shouldn't there be standards about when we pick one or the other? How do you even decide when to pick one or the other? Uh, and should the government just allow some but not others? I think there's a few answers to that. One is that, as you recall, when we built these conference intervals, we had discretion. We had choice. We didn't have to circle the biggest number. You know, we could have circled the smallest numbers. Um, we had options about what to circle. That wasn't true when we made the Bayesian credible intervals. Those were just determined. Well, actually, I get the, the 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 posterior probability that the Bayesians have is determined by the prior, your model of the experiment. Those together make the posterior. But then deciding which interval to include, there's still discretion, because do you want the most central interval? Do you want the one that's shortest? Um, there's actually still some wiggle room in exactly how you define the Bayesian credible interval. So there's not just one right answer. And the government's position in the, so there's a few things. Number one, the government's position has historically been, as long as you set out the test before you do the experiment, and as long as the test makes sure that if the drug doesn't work, there's less than a 5% chance it'll be falsely approved, then you can pick any test you want. Because that's the thing they care about, is making sure that you know, P is less than 0.05. If the drug doesn't work, the null hypothesis is true, there has to be less than a 5% chance that you mistakenly you know, approve the drug. So then you could do any test that meets that criterion. And you know, formally speaking, that criterion is that this line has to be exactly below uh, the dotted line. The other thing I'll say is that you know, there are fancier tests that now use computers that are not you know, from the whole history of the 19th century. So here's a very fancy test in stat exact that actually meets this criterion. This is what happens if you use the supercomputers. Um, it, it never goes above the line, but on the other hand, it goes way below the line. So statistics is not just about calculation, it's about persuasion. And you know, this is, it's a language. So the biostatisticians who work for the company are trying to persuade the statisticians who work for the government, and the doctors who write the medical guidelines are trying to persuade them to prescribe a certain thing. So if they pick some exotic test that no one's ever heard of, yes, it might be mathematically better in some sense, but it might be less persuasive because people are less familiar with it. So that's probably why they choose this walled interval is because, you know, it's the one everyone had been using in the past and why they don't know some persnickety reporter. Well, first of all, they don't know they're going to get very unlucky and be right on the line and some persnickety reporter is going to rerun the calculations. They just, why diverge from what people have done that works? Um, it, it works persuasively even if it doesn't work mathematically. Interesting. Yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. Yes? Well, doesn't a lot depend on 
how you value the results. I mean, it might be a lot worse to have a heart attack than to have a diminution in the... In the Gospels? <laughs> I don't know. I, yeah. I don't... In the success of um, keeping down your diabetes. I mean, mm -hmm. it depends. Are you more worried mm -hmm. about this result or that result? Maybe, yeah. And, and on that basis, you might choose different tests, right? Well, I, well the, the question is, uh, maybe you want to weight different outcomes differently. Like you might weight the possibility of an increase in heart attacks one way, and you might weight the benefit from a decrease in diabetes a different way. Uh, yes, I agree with you. Uh, historically, the FDA has not done you know, cost-benefit analysis. Uh, that's for doctors to do. Uh, the FDA does not regulate the practice of medicine. They regulate the marketing of pharmaceuticals, uh, and they, they make sure that the purpose that they're marketed for, the indication, they have to be safe and they have to be effective. That's the legal mandate of the government. Uh, the, but the government is not really supposed to do the cost-benefit calculation. That's for trained medical professionals to do. So they sort of avoid doing this utilitarian calculation. But of course, they do it. Uh, they do it kind of under the table. So for example, I think when people wanted to get approval for automated defibrillators, uh, you know, these automated defibrillators do not meet the standards, the reliability standards of conventional defibrillators. And so you can imagine a government agency saying like, well, we've defined what it means for a defibrillator to be effective, and your plastic defibrillator that costs, you know, 300 bucks is not effective, you know, it's, or it's, it's not as reliable as, as we've required of a real defibrillator, so can't be licensed as a defibrillator. And I think the manufacturers were able to persuade the FDA that, look, there's a benefit to having these things be cheap because we can put them everywhere, and you know what really matters is uh, proximity to the defibrillator because when your heart, you know, if it has sudden cardiac arrest, you want one that's close. Even if it's only 99.9% .9 reliable, <laughs> if it's close, that's better than having to wait for the ambulance to get to you in Times Square and have one that's 99.999% reliable. You know, there is a trade-off here, and so the FDA should lower its standards for reliability for these automated defibrillators. And the FDA did that. Um, so that is making the kind of utilitarian decision you're talking about, but it's within this sort of regulatory framework of the law. Do you have any medical companies that use Mongo? Yes, I believe. Yeah, so <laughs> I mean, these kinds of issues, you know, they might be wrestling with. How do you slice the data? How do you find correlations? Oh, yeah, the big one. It, the problem is we don't know. We never remember what we can say out loud. Well, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Thanks, Keith. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.